one of the most incredible events that has occurred in the history of military warfare happened on Christmas Eve in 1914. History has called this event the Christmas Truce. The First World War had just begun in Europe. It had only been going on six, eight months. And the Allied forces were fighting against the German armies, armies capturing territory basically a foot or a yard at a time. It was very tough going. Back then, war was fought on the ground primarily. And each side would give a series of trenches with the other forces a couple hundred yards away and they would dig trenches. And by trenches, these would be long rows. They'd be about 36 inches deep, 36 inches wide. And the men would be hunkered down in there and they were filled with mud and water. And you didn't stand up because the people in the other trenches were waiting for you to do that and you would be shot. And you could spend weeks in those trenches. The area that was in between the two forces was called no man's land. Because if you got out of your trench and tried to get across, that's when you would be shot. But ultimately, sooner or later, at some point in time, one side decided now would be the best time to jump out of our trenches and charge the other forces. At which point then it would erupt into just brutal, ferocious, hand-to-hand -hand combat. And a good portion of the military forces on each side would suffer incredible losses. I think over 15 million soldiers died during World War I. So here, picture, I want to paint a picture of the circumstances and what it was like. On a battlefield in Belgium in December of 1914, the two forces had been exchanging fire back and forth for a couple weeks, each out of their own respective trenches. On Christmas Eve, it said that the British soldiers started hearing some sort of ruckus or something going on over in the trenches of the Germans. And they couldn't figure out at first what it was. And so they kept listening and listening, and it got a little louder and a little louder. And then they realized they were singing. They were singing, and they started listening. And as the sound as more of the Germans joined in each other, and they started all along that trench, they realized that they were singing Christmas carols. Well, after a while, some of the British soldiers in their trenches started singing and joining with them, singing along. When the Germans heard the British singing also, one of them who could speak decent English yelled over, come over here, we sing together. Sounds a little like a trap, don't you think? One of the British sergeants replied and yelled over, You come halfway, I come halfway. Well, it took about 10 minutes before they slowly started to come up out of the trenches. First one, another, another, and they began to walk across the weaving, bobbing in and out of the barbed wire, and they finally were all out there in the middle of no man's <coughs> land. Standing there, staring at each other. It was very tense at first. But then suddenly, the men began shaking hands. And exchanging words of kindness. Hugging one another. Singing the carols. They started swapping cigarettes and sausages and wine. And they had a great time trading those things instead of bullets. And they all started singing. And the Germans had little candles and they started to light the candles. And they would go over to little evergreen trees and they were placing them in the trees as they celebrated Christmas. Somebody on the British side, all of a sudden, I don't know how he had it, he had a soccer ball. And so they built two 
little makeshift goals in no man's land. And there were several hundred soldiers out there having what they call a kickabout. All just kicking the ball and just having a grand time. One soldier, one British soldier wrote, Here they were, the practical, actual soldiers of the German army. And there was not one atom of hate on either side. Another soldier wrote back home, Here we were, laughing and chatting with the men whom only a few hours before we were trying to kill. In reading the events of this particular evening, the events of this Christmas truce, a lot of people wonder, and even wonder today, what in the world could possibly produce this sort of peace? The answer is simple. The answer is Jesus. You see, once they started to sing Christmas songs, Christmas, the celebration of the coming of Jesus, once Jesus was exalted, it didn't matter which side you were on, peace can ensue. In this world, there can be no peace without Jesus. And with Jesus, there is peace. He is the peace, the Prince of Peace in this world. Now about 2,600 years before this happened, God said it would. God had already said that peace was coming, that they would be able to enjoy. And we find this recording of the coming peace in Micah, an Old Testament prophet Everybody found Micah already? You got it in your books already? You got to go past Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. You got to get working up closer and closer to the New Testament. Getting closer and closer if you get to the Z's. Zechariah, you need to back up a little. Micah, it's a short book. We're going to be looking at the fifth chapter of Micah, verses 1 through 5. And just the first verse, uh, first sentence in 5. Hear the word of the Lord in the writing of Micah. Now muster yourselves in troops, daughters of troops. They have laid siege against us. With a rod they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephraim, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has born a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. And he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will remain because at that time he will be great. All the way to the ends of the earth. And this one will be our Micah wrote these words, God has pronounced a judgment on Israel because they have rebelled, they have rejected him, and it turned to worshiping of idols. And God had warned them through the prophets and warned them and warned them and they refused to surrender to God's authority in their lives. And so God would send the Assyrians to conquer and destroy them and take them captive. And that's what verse 1 is all about. Get your troops ready because here they're coming and they will be my arm of judgment. There will be no peace while this happens. Only war, calamity, destruction, judgment. But then you get to the second verse. And although God would judge the wrong and the rebellious and the sinful, he says, still, I will send something other than war. I will send you peace. If you read carefully in that text, it's the promise of two comings of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
two comings of peace. Notice that the first one it says that Jesus would come out of Bethlehem. The one whom I am sending will come out of Bethlehem. <coughs> Bethlehem at this point in time was a teeny, tiny, little, know-nothing village. It would be like saying that the ruler of the entire world is going to be born in Bumpus, Virginia. <laughs> it might happen, who knows. <laughs> But note that God also says in this passage that this one who is coming, the one that he is sending, he's going to be a ruler who has always existed. It says from the days of eternity, though he would be born as a baby in a manger, because it is at that point in time that he takes on humanity, and takes on human flesh, the one that he is sending, the Prince of Peace, has always existed. He is the Son of God. God would give Israel over in judgment, but in time he would send peace from his judgment. And the judgment time is painful. He said it's going to be like a woman in labor. That kind of painful. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. But then he'll send peace. Because the one whom he is going to send will bring peace to mankind. I like in that verse, there's two different, those two verses, two different comings. One is the first coming, and one is the second. One is when he brought peace, and the world rejected it, and they crucified him, instead of accepting him as the Prince of Peace. And then you get to the next verse, and now it's talking about his second coming. This happens a couple times through the prophets. In Isaiah 6 9, it starts off by saying, uh, for, for a child will be born to us, and a son will be given to us, and there's a semicolon. And then it says, and the government will rest on his shoulders. Well, the child was born. But the government of the world didn't rest on his shoulders. The governments of the world killed him. But the second coming, the governments of the world will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Micah is talking about the same two comings. The first one when he comes, that he would be the child that would come out of a woman and then, once the child has come, then true peace will happen. His death and resurrection is what brings us peace with God. So we don't think of it often, but without a relationship with Christ, we are at war with God. Because we say, we don't want your authority. That means we're rebellion. We don't believe what you said, that Christ is the only way of salvation. That means you call God a liar. You're an enemy of God until you accept Christ as your Savior. But once you do that, you are no longer an enemy with God. You get to change sides. It would be like moving out of this trench and over into that trench. You change sides. You now have peace. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. We're no longer at war with God. We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So the peace that Christ brings, first of all, is peace with God. There is no other way that you can be on God's side, on His team, in His family, unless you have peace with Him. But if we continue reading, that's what he talks about now about the second coming. That now that Christ is coming the second time. And in the Old Testament, this is a view of the millennial kingdom. Of which Gentiles, we will also be a part. But in particular for the, uh, for the Jews, these are the responsive answers that God had made commitments and covenants with Isaac and Abraham and, and Jacob and 
the, the fulfillment of these will be the millennial kingdom. When Christ comes the second time and establishes the government over the whole world for a thousand years. And this is particularly pointing to this point. But remember, we're part of that too. When Christ came and gave us peace with God, the Old Testament didn't understand the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They're looking forward to a kingdom with a ruler. That's why they rejected Christ as the Messiah. He didn't have no army with him. He wasn't overthrowing the government. They didn't understand that Christ would then move into the hearts of all who believe him. And then we get another kind of peace. The Jews are looking for a peace that's going to happen in the kingdom. We understand that the peace, another peace comes soon as you accept Christ as Savior. Not only do you have peace with God, you get the peace of God. They're two different things. Because you can't get the peace of God until you have peace with God. So what is the peace of God? What is that? That's when God becomes your ruler. They saw it as a nation. We understand it as when God becomes the ruler and king and master over our lives. The Bible talks there about this ruler that God is going to send. Being the shepherd who will arise... And he will care for his flock. Folks, that's us. He died on the cross. He rose for all who believe in him. He now moves. His spirit moves inside of us. And he cares as a shepherd would care for us. Providing for us and caring for us. Loving us. Feeding us. And he says, and he will glorify the Father in all the earth. And he will be great to the ends of the earth. What he has begun in the hearts of believers today, he will continue to build and build and build on until one day he does come physically, literally, to this earth again. Stand on the Mount of Olives. Issue a word out of his mouth and will destroy all of his enemies. And cause the millennial glorious kingdom. It will be like a kingdom of Eden on this earth. It will be a point in time when not only will we all have peace with God, but we will have the peace of God. And the peace of God will rule and reign not only in our hearts, but also then as we relate and deal with other people. Jesus told his disciples in John 16, 33, that this world, the place that we are living and they were living, he said this is just a place of tribulation. You can't get away from it. There will never be eaten. There will never be peace on this earth. It's not going to happen. In over 3,000 years of recorded history, there have only been a couple hundred years where there's not a, 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 a major war or conflict going on. Out of 3,000. And when there were those couple brief years without a conflict, it was just time for everybody to reload. This world will never, ever produce peace. So all those beauty contestants who all wrote up there said, well, I just want to, I want to make sure that I have world peace. <laughs> <laughs> just yell at the TV. It's not going to happen. At least not until Christ comes. But Jesus said this world is a world of tribulation. There cannot be peace. But let me tell you, I've got some peace. I have peace. The world has none. I have it. It belongs to me. And I'll give it to you. He said, because the peace I have, I give to you. And it's not the kind of peace that the world has. Because that's fake. It doesn't last. It's temporary at best. He said, I'll give you mine. I have peace with the Father. You can have peace with the Father. I have the peace of God in me. I'll give you that too. That's some serious peace. And you won't find it anywhere else. So the Advent message of peace points us to the only place we can find it. And it's the promise of peace that Christ made for all of us. Because no philosophy is going to give you peace. No government, no ruler, no dictator, no, no court 
will ever be able to lead you to peace. And no amount of wealth or prosperity can buy it or produce it. You can't get it anywhere else. Because the peace, real peace, the peace of God, can only come from Jesus Christ. He is the only source. He is the Prince of Peace. And we as believers have that powerful promise of peace. That's why a Christian can be lying in a hospital bed waiting for a very serious, delicate surgery that's about to happen and yet they can have peace. That's why a Christian who gets the doctor's call with the test results that show that they have cancer, yet they can have peace. That's why the Christian who's concerned about the lives of their children and grandchildren and the choices that they've made or the choices that they've refused to make, they can still have peace. It's because the Christian peace is not found in the circumstances or even in the results of the things that go on in this world. Our peace is found in Jesus and in Jesus alone. When those soldiers took their minds off of the terrible circumstances of being huddled down in those mud water filled trenches for weeks at a time, shivering in the bitter cold, limited rations, when they took their minds off of that and they began to sing carols of celebration of Christ the newborn King. Peace happened. It happened in the midst of those circumstances and the only reason for the Christmas truce, the only way it can be explained is because Jesus that's why when we too, when we get in the middle of whatever it is that's going on around us, whatever it is we're going through, when He becomes what we focus on, He becomes the object of our focus, He becomes what it is that we cling to and grab to, He becomes the hope that we know that we have, then at that point in time, His peace becomes ours. And we can lay hold of that. I can't explain exactly how it happens, but I'm here to tell you based on the Word of God and in the experiences and the men and women that I know and have talked to, I know that it does happen. And it can happen for you. That the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guide our minds and our hearts in Christ Jesus. Jesus came to give us peace with God so that we are no longer enemies. But He lives now, today, and forevermore to make sure that we have the peace of God living within us. He is the promise of peace. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Father God, thank You for the promise of peace. Lord, forgive us for all the many times we look elsewhere for it. All the many things that we think might bring peace into our lives. All the many things, Lord, that we depend upon sadly and futilely. Father God, thank you for providing the one and only source of peace. And thank you, Lord, for the promises that you have made. That you will always provide it when we need it to the extent that we need it, even more than we need it when we trust in you. 